as we come to this place, I think we need to go back to the very beginning. The very beginning of God's story. We need to kind of go back to creation. Remember the song? Let's start at the very beginning, the very good place to start. When we begin, we begin with what? A, B, C. Isn't that what Maria Van Trapp sang to the kids as she was teaching them music? You know, sometimes when you want to learn something and you want to get a perspective on something, you need to go back to the very beginning. And we need to go back to the beginning where God created. We need to go back to that point to gain an understanding and perspective of God's viewpoint and God's love for his creation. Because in the beginning, God looked out on the earth and it was empty and formless and darkness was everywhere. And then God all of a sudden moved and he created out of nothingness. Theologians will call this ex nihilo, out of nothing. God moved and created. Bible says it was by his very word of his mouth that he created all things. And so on the first day, God created light. And he says, this is good. This is good. On the third day, God separated the water from the dry land. And he looks around and he declares it good. And he continues on the third day to create plants. Seed-bearing plants, fruit-bearing plants. He starts to make all the vegetation. He creates. And God declared, it was good. On the fourth day, God created day and night so that the light and the darkness were separated. And he looked around and he said, it is good. So on the fifth day, God starts creating the fish who swim the seas and the birds of the air and everything. I love this translation. Everything that scurries around on the ground. And he looks around and he says it was good. The creation was good. On the sixth day, he decided that it was time to make human beings in the image of the triune God. So that man, you and I, could be stewards a better word, or to reign over the creation. We were going to be created male and female in the image of God so that we would be God's representatives in this world over all his creation. That we would be representatives of God in the created order. That's a tremendous purpose to live for. And at the end of the sixth day, God declared, it is good. It is good. Wonderful place to start, isn't it? Did you catch that? God created and everything was good. But then the next thing, what happens? All of a sudden, Adam and Eve are rebelling against a good God. They decided that their knowledge of things was better than what God had given them. So in direct rebellion, they did their own thing. Sound familiar? Next thing you know, Cain is killing his brother Abel for no other reason than Cain's worship of God pleased God more than what Cain did. Because I imagine Cain's heart really wasn't 100% into worshiping God. And by the time we get over to chapter 6, oh, the world was a mess. Everything had gone completely haywire. And the Lord observed the extent of the human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry that he made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Think about that for a second. God's heart was grieved. He had made his people to represent everything about God's character. He put his character in us. He put all his values 
of who he was and what he believed in us. And his creation did its own thing. And God's heart is grieved. To grieve is to be swallowed up by sadness. I know some of you have experienced that. Or to be completely engulfed with the pain or the weight of the sadness. And for some people, the grief can go to the point of even despair. See, grief stirs your heart. Grief stirs all your emotions. By the way, grief also distracts you. If you've been through grief, if you've lost the love of your life, or you lost somebody close and important to you, in the early part of grief, you are so distracted, you have a hard time functioning to do the daily activities of your life. You kind of wander and drift. Grief floods your life with stress. And God is in grief. It broke his heart what he saw people doing. And the Lord said, I will wipe the human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing on earth. Uh, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. Of the sky. I am sorry I even made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. In the midst of grief, in the midst of God's grief about his creation and his sorrow, there is a redemptive hope. Noah found favor with God. Think about that for a second. In our crazy world that we get all excited about when the news goes crazy and we hear all these things of wars and rumors of wars and we hear all these people who are denying God and trying to destroy his creation and they want to mar the common sense and they deface the name of God and they manipulate God's words to their own satisfaction. In the midst of all that chaos, there is a redemptive hope. And Peter says it's the hope that we have that our Savior has risen from the dead and we can hang on to that thread. That we can hang on to the thread of hope that is found in Jesus Christ. See, I think too often we look at our world as followers of Christ and we get angry. We get mad. We want justice. And we want to avenge the harm or pain that others may have inflicted upon us because we're followers of Jesus Christ. I've heard several people give testimonies about how people have said to them, well, you might have Jesus, but nah, you, you can have the crutch in your life. I don't need that crutch. Well, I've said it before. Give me two of them then. Because I'll take a crutch called Jesus any day of the week. But you know, sometimes we get mad at that. And when people mock us and scorn us for our belief in Christ, they, they ridicule us for being a follower of Jesus. We do get angry. And we want God to fulfill his promise. Remember he says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And we say, let him repay him now, Lord. Come on. And it's like we pray, God, sick him. Now, we don't quite say it that way because we're holier. And we have nice theological language. But the heart is saying, go get them, God. I want that person. I want them to feel your wrath and your pain. See, I want God to bring justice on my terms. Early in Revelation, we saw that, right? We read about the prayers of the martyrs, right? They were crying out for justice. And they shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? They had been persecuted and martyred. How long, God, do we have to wait? And even on the evening of following the Passover meal, Jesus goes out in the garden with his disciples and he's praying. And he's crying out to God. He comes back to his disciples and he says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here 
keep watch with me. Basically, stay alert. Keep awake. The pain of the cross that lay before him, the weight of the sin of the world that was going to be placed on him, the separation that was going to take place between him and Abba was weighing on him, crushing his spirit to the point of death. He was grieving what was taking place. He was grieving the sin of the world. And as we come to chapter 16 in Revelation, God is going to start pouring out his wrath. We need to understand that God is judging a creation that he declared was good and perfect. A creation that he loved. So we don't... don't We can't be cavalier about these passages. We can't think that he acted capriciously or impulsively. We need to understand that God acted with a grieving heart. He loved us so much, but he's filled with sorrow. He's touched by the pain. And he moves brokenheartedly to fulfill the promise of true justice as he acts righteously in judgment. I wonder if God was crying as he thought about us and knew what he was going to have to do to our world, the world he created. I'll never forget the first time I had to discipline my oldest child, Sarah. She was about two and a half, maybe three. And she just put her hands on her hips and gave me a look and then said, I'm not doing that. Everything she said, she was going to rebel against her her dad's advice to live a better life, to obey the rules. Does that sound familiar? And I'll tell you, with lots of tears and anguish of heart, I had to discipline her. And the aftermath of disciplining her, my heart was grieved. God grieves for us. See, I actually think that Sarah would say to you, I wish Dad hadn't given me those lectures after he disciplined us and just let it go. But I remember when she was that little girl I picked her up in my arms because I knew I had been angry and I talked about how much I loved her and how much she was cared for and I think that's how God looks as he brings about judgment in this world he cares for us, he cares for the people he's judging and that's why Paul says to us do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live See, you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, have an obligation. If we're committed allegiantly to the Lamb, the one who was slain for us, because what? He's going to save us on the day of redemption. Because we have made our allegiance with Him, because of what He did on the cross, He's going to redeem us. But we have an obligation to live in this world not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to bring sorrow to God. There's also another truth that we need to remember as we see judgment being poured out. That the heart is sinful. It's actually corrupt beyond measure. Jeremiah put it this way, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? You see, Sarah was never taught to stand there defiantly with her hands on her hips and give me that look and say those words. But the heart's deceitful. That's why you need a heart surgeon named Jesus to come and give you a new heart and create a new life in you. Our sinful hearts lead us away from God. Our sinful hearts have us act in rebellion against God We break his laws, we break his commandments, we deserve the punishment. 
And that's what he says in the next verse in Jeremiah. But I, the Lord, search all hearts. Think about that. God searches your hearts. And sometimes you and I do things that we think we've covered up our motive. And God says, not a chance. I examine those secret motives. I give people their due reward according to what they deserve, their actions deserve. God's clear, judgment is what people deserve. When God pours out his judgment on unrepentant sinners, worshipers of the beast, it is exactly because they worship the beast, they worship idols, their attitudes and their actions deserve the punishment they are going to receive because they have what? Chosen not to worship the Lord, the creator, with all their heart, mind, and body soul. They have chosen another path. And in that moment, John hears the command from the temple. And all of a sudden, he he hears the mighty voice saying, go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So God's going to now move quickly. And so it begins, the angels start to pour out the content of the bowls, and we notice that judgments are more intense, the devastation is far greater than the previous judgments. And the first bowl is poured out, and, and the sores came on people who had the mark of the beast or worshipped the beast. And they were festering sores and painful sores. They were incurable sores. But there was no excuse. They really had no excuse. They couldn't say to God, well, I didn't think you really meant it. (laughs) I've heard children say that to me. (laughs) They can't come up with any excuse. Because do you remember what we learned earlier in Revelation? The third angel followed them, shouting, anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts the mark on the forehead or on the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of holy angels and the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will, will rise forever and ever and they will, what, have no relief day or night for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Because of the choice they have made, the sores will be incurable. They're going to continue to eat them up. They have no excuse. And all the people who belong to the world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Think about that for a second. God knew that his son would be slaughtered because of how he was going to create the world. And the free choice that we were given to love him willingly or reject him. There's no excuse. But there's another thing we need to remember, too, that those who are on Team Lamb, you and Team Lamb are under God's protective hand. Wait, don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until I have placed the seal of God on their foreheads of the servants. That's what one of the witnesses came out to say, right? Isn't that what we learned? And then Jesus said to the church, Because you have obeyed my command to preserve, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. That God is going to protect his people. We must need to always remember that there will be people who are followers of the Lamb in the tribulation, and they will be protected by God no matter what else is going on around them. No matter how bad the outpouring of God's wrath, they will be protected. The second bowl is poured out. And the seas and the oceans are now turning to blood. The devastating effects are now becoming accumulative. For the people that have the sores can't wash the wounds to bring about healing, to promote healing, to rinse them out. That's one of the first things doctors like to do. You come in with a wound, what do they do? They want to rinse it out. They want to sterilize it. They want to help get some of the impurities out. But The ocean waters are now all, what? Blood. And imagine this. 
You ever been down to Pike's Market near the end of the day and some of the fish have been sitting in a case a little too long? And there's a little smell of fishiness, even though they've been packed on ice? Think about it when every living creature in the sea is floating on the top of the water dead. The ghoulishness, the smelliness of what is there. You got to remember, it's going to be massive because 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, by ocean water. The third bowl is pulled out. The third bowl is poured out, and then all of a sudden, now all the fresh water, rivers, streams, springs, wells, all that water has now turned to blood too. And now that means the water supply is now critical. And then on top of that, we already had learned in Revelation that there will be no rainfall, right? They have the power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. God has already warned them. This is going to create such hardship, it's going to be hard to imagine that an angel has the power to meld out God's justice. And then another angel all of a sudden, in what we would think maybe sounds like cruelty, you have people with wounds and they can't get healed. There's no water now to drink. You know, you can live without food for a long time as long as you have water. But the angel says this. You are just, O oh, Holy One, who is, who always was, because you have sent these judgments. Since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them in blood to drink. It is their just reward. It continues to say that your acts, O Lord, are just and true. The earth at this point is, the earth is at a point now where life is really unsustainable. And then all of a sudden, quickly after that, the angel, another angel pours out a bowl, the fourth bowl. And he pours it out on the sun. And the intense heat of the sun is going to burn people who have the mark of the beast, who have worshipped and are part of Team Dragon. Let me just say it this way. There is no sunblock strong enough to protect you from what God plans to do to those who don't worship him and love him. The unrepentant sinner. The sun's heat is going to intensify. And what's the response of the people? Now, if you were in that moment, you're going through a hardship, who do you turn to? But the people, everyone was burned by the blast of heat. They cursed the name of God who had control control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. Think about that. They didn't turn back to God. They got angry. In response to God's judgment, they adopt Satan's defiant evil character and spew their hatred of God even more. Their hatred literally increases. They do not repent. There doesn't even seem to be a willingness to want to repent. Now, I don't know about you, But when God moves in conviction on my life, I repent. When God is grabbing my attention in such a way that I need to be listening, my heart and my face are down before him, and I seek him. And my prayer usually is this, forgive me my sins, O Lord. Wash me anew with with hyssop, and create in me a new heart, O God and restore a right spirit within me. But these people will not ask for repentance. They will not seek God's face. You see, that goes against the culture because there's a wishful idea that flows through our culture and flows through our society 
that people will see the hand of God and the power of God and his righteous judgment and they, they'll start to repent. It's not happening. It's a myth. And God is shattering that myth right here, right in this place. Because the hardness of people's hearts toward God is going to be fully revealed. And like Pharaoh, the hearts are going to be hardened. You remember Pharaoh? All the plagues in Egypt were attacks against the gods of Egypt. Think about that. And every time Moses did something and God's movement against that God of Egypt was defeated or embarrassed or shown up by the power of the living God, the creator, hardens. Pharaoh said, no, 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 can't be true. I don't believe it. It's a magic trick. And he continued to believe the lie of false worship. And that's what's happening in our, these days, that we have people who are believing the lie of Babylon. They're believing that money saves all things. They believe in so many other ways that you can change how God created things so that you can decide who you are and how you feel about things instead of knowing that God created you lovingly and intentionally, male and female. And we have all these lies going on in culture. And we've hardened our hearts. The fifth angel pours out the, the ball the bowl on the throne of the beast. That's tough to say. On the throne of the beast. And the beast kingdom is suddenly in utter darkness. God has all of a sudden removed the light. God is turning out the lights. I remember growing up watching Monday Night Football. Uh, and Dandy Don used to sing Willie Nelson's song near the end sometime in the fourth quarter. Turn out the lights, the party's over. All good things come to an end. The game was out of reach. Well, let me just tell you, at that point, God's turning out the lights because the party is over. The party is over. In the darkness with their wounds festering, they're sore. The evil people are what? Grinding their teeth is what the New Living Translation is. They're grinding their teeth. But let me just tell you what the Greek says because I think it's so powerful. They were gnawing on their tongues. It gives a whole new meaning to bite your tongue. It really does. It's another one of these sad moments in the text for me because the people cursed God and did not repent. They did not turn from their evil deeds. They didn't turn back to God. And I don't know what was holding them back because I don't know what holds people back even now. I can't imagine any good reason not to turn to God when you're in a crisis. But people do it all the time. In the middle of a lot of crises, people get angry and upset with God instead of trying to figure out what value the crisis has to discover that the presence of God is always there with you in the crisis. Joshua knew that he couldn't follow him Moses is a leader, and what does he say? He's, he's upset, and God says to him, don't be discouraged. I'm always with you. Obey the instructions that I've given you. Follow the rules and commandments that I have laid out before you, and I will be with you, and you will prosper. So in the middle of a crisis, I want to turn to God. So I, it breaks my heart to know that these people, in this moment, still having the opportunity to turn to God, because that's what's implied in the text refuse to turn to God and curse him. And by the way, this is the last time the book of Revelation ever references repentance. The time is coming when there will be no second chance. But until that moment, Revelation appears to be saying that people do have a chance to repent. And here's the truth. Truly evil people will not repent. Their blasphemy of God and for God only deepens. And in ignoring God, they are confirming their choice. As the drama increases and tensions rise, the sixth angel pours out the wrath of God on the Euphrates River. So, you know, now think about this. 
we had intense heat, right? People were being fried and burned. So polar ice kelps have melted. Glaciers on mountains have melted. And so the water flowing down a lot of these rivers, like the Euphrates or the Clay Elms, the Yakima to the Columbia, there's lots of water everywhere. And all of a sudden, this angel pours out the wrath of God and everything grows dry. The Euphrates River, all 1,800 miles of it from Mount Arafat in Turkey to the Persian Gulf is now completely dry because the armies of the east are going to come and there's going to be a great war. Well, they think there's going to be a war because they actually have the arrogance to believe that they're going to go fight the Lord God Almighty. The arrogance is they think they can win. Now, let me just say something about these kings of the east because somebody's thinking, that. well, who are the kings of the east? I don't know if it really matters, but I can tell you this. There are over 50 different interpretations of who those kings are. So let's just leave it as the armies of the earth are going to be gathering to stand up against the Lord. And this is actually going to be Satan's final work. The unholy trinity, the beast, the false prophet, and Satan is moving to create this major war. They're going to defiantly move because they believe as the counterfeit trinity that they can move without impunity against God and they can win. And coming out of the mouths of the three look like frogs, but they're prophets, and they are going out as demons to what? Ask the nations of the world to assemble to battle against God Almighty. And then all of a sudden, Jesus speaks. We haven't seen Jesus speaking for a long time. And he says, look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief, blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And that raises this question, are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord to come? Jesus had already given us the warning, right? He told his disciples, tells us in Luke 12, understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was going to come, <laughs> he, wouldn't perm- he would not permit his house to be broken into if you knew when something was going to happen, you, it, they could harm you, you're going to try to avoid it, right? Peter put it this way, but on the day the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it to be fa- <coughs> will be found to deserve judgment. God's going to move, but it's going to be unexpectedly. Jesus, will, Jesus' return will overtake those who are not alert, who have not been preparing. Our job is to guard our hearts in Christ Jesus, that we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, allowing the fruits of the Spirit to be dominant in our lives, that we are putting the needs of others first, that we are compassionately talking to others about what our God looks like and how he can change and transform our life. And every day we need to be getting up and making sure we have short accounts with God. That we're asking for forgiveness of those things that we've screwed up in. Because we're still screw-ups. Let's be honest. We still make mistakes. I don't want to go over the list of the ones I made yesterday. But I know before God every day I have to get right. Are we allowing the Savior through the Holy Spirit to really work in our lives so that we're ready that when he comes back, we're going to be rejoicing and praising God. The seventh angel all of a sudden moves, and he pours his bowl into the air, and with that, a mighty voice is shouting, It is finished! The Greek tense here is so important because it means it's a completed action. It's finished. It's done. God's wrath was being poured out. And what happens in response is thunder starts sounding and lightning flashes across the skies. Earthquakes are devastating the planets. Mountains are decimated. We live in a glorious place with beautiful cascades and the Stuart Range. They surround us. We see the beauty of mountains. Look out there when you go out and you leave church and imagine those laying all flat. And islands disappear. God is moving. 
God remembers the sins of Babylon. And the text says that as the final outpouring of his wrath, God forces Babylon to drink of the cup of his wrath. The end of the time of tribulation has ended. And as it ends, 75 to 100 pound hailstones start falling from the sky. And the people who are surviving this still are cursing God. Their hearts are hardened. And I grieve, I grieve for those who do not turn their hearts to God. I grieve and contend for hearts of people who are hardening their hearts for God. Our, one of our speakers of leadership, Tune Up, used a word that I hadn't heard in a long time. I remember going to Assemblies of God churches with my mom. We'd go to the Baptist, Black Baptist Church in the morning, and we'd go to an AG Pentecostal church in the evening. And I remember people in that AG church saying, I'm contending for the soul of someone before God. We don't use language like that anymore, but we should be. Are we contending for the soul of our family and friends? Do we grieve that they have not surrendered their life to Christ yet? Are we going to contend in prayer for them? Because the day is coming when there will be no chance to repent. Because no one escapes God's wrath. Unless you're part of Team Lamb. Let's get more people on Team Lamb. The utter perversity and depravity of our human nature, which rebels against God's sovereignty, rejects God's love, will receive exactly what it deserves. People have chosen who they will follow and who they will worship. And God, in his grief, is not surprised. He grieves it, but he's not surprised. Paul put it this way. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to whatever shameful things their hearts desired. And as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is what? Worthy of eternal praise. Amen. See, that's where the world is. They think everything they've created is cool. And they believe in their technology. They believe in their philosophy. But they're worshiping created things, not the creator. Jeremiah records the word of the Lord this way. But the Lord made the earth by his power and he preserves it by his wisdom with his own understanding. He stretched out the heavens and when he speaks in the thunder, the heavens roar with rain. He causes the clouds to rise over the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and releases the wind from his storehouses. The human race, oh, this is so cool. The human race is foolish and it has no knowledge. The craftsmen are disgraced by the idols they make for they carefully shaped works are a fraud because their idols have no breath or power their idols are worthless. They are ridiculous lies. Dun, 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 dun. All I can think of is Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. That's a fact. That's a fact. And all day of reckoning, they will be destroyed. By, but the God of Israel is no idol. He is the creator of everything that exists, including Israel, his own special possession. The Lord of heaven's army is his name. And we look at that and we say, well, that's just Israel. What about us? You've got to remember what Paul says in Romans, that you and I as Gentiles are grafted into that tree of Israel, and we are the new Israel as the church of Jesus Christ. So we are his special possession, Peter says, a people of his own choosing, that God has chosen to redeem us, and he wants to care for us. But those who are worshiping the created things, they're in trouble. And that brings me a question of application for you is where's your heart? Because are you worshiping all the creative things that you've had, all the things you love? And it's good to have toys. I love my toys. I love my technology. But do they dominate my life? Do they control my life? 
until that awful day when God's wrath is being poured out, I want you to understand there is still a choice. Hebrews put it this way, that God sent another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the world already quoted, in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Is God speaking to you today? Don't harden your heart. The time to set aside your doubts, the time to set aside your speculations about God and about the future is here. Are you preparing to meet the living Christ when he comes? Are you preparing your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus that you can enter into God's rest for all eternity? Please hear God's voice this morning, today. Don't harden your heart. Take the time to ask Jesus into your life to be your Savior, to be your Lord. Ask Jesus to change and transform you so that the fruit of God's Spirit will live in you and others may see what God is doing in your life and be drawn to him. That's part of the witness. Don't harden your heart. Give your life. Surrender it to Jesus today. Father God, we just thank you for these time and these words. Speak to us, Lord. Watch over us and guide us. And Holy Spirit, I just ask if someone's really struggling and they're, they're thinking about getting right with you and getting back to following you or just following you for the first time, we just ask that you move in their hearts. Help them to break down the barriers and objections, Lord Jesus, so that they may be part of Team Lamb with you as their guide and Savior. Prepare all of our hearts for that day when you return. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for creating us. And may each one of us not grieve your spirit in how we live, but we live for you each and every day. So Holy Spirit, move in our lives.